Amen. So, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, you guys remember last time we were together, we began this second section in this book uh, dealing with, well, really, chapter 2 and chapter th 3 is really dealing with uh, instructions for the people in the church. So, there's two groups that we were mentioned uh, specifically in chapter 2, and that's the first is the men, and second is the women, right? So, the first. Uh, group about the men we already talked about and that really uh, in the first verses 1 through 8 that was really dealing with prayer that was dealing with the men but the issue was prayer and we saw six things that pertains to uh, the, 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 the men's prayer life basically and, and the issue is prayer so the men were to take that lead role in prayer specifically not only as it pertains to us personally uh, in you know in our marriage relationship, but also as it pertains to us corporately as men in the church corporately. So, ladies, Paul didn't want you guys to feel left out. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul just said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna add this in there for them too." But you know, obviously, he didn't want you to be neglected. So, chapter two, verses uh, nine through fifteen, we're gonna look at uh, the women now. So, Paul gives the instructions for the woman in the church. So, let's just read the context so that we know what we're getting ourselves into. 1 Timothy chapter 2, let's start at verse 9, and let's go down to verse 15. It says, In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was born first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, fell into transgression, <coughs> Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, number three, holiness with self-control. So, um, man, first of all, I have to uh, warn you guys that there has been much discussion, there's been much debates about this passage specifically. I didn't uh, choose to teach this because I wanted to. Obviously, we've been going book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so this isn't something I'm so excited for. This is one of those where I'm like, okay, I know I'm going to die, so <laughs> Lord, forgive me my sins before I do this. <laughs> so, just so you guys know, where do we just go verse by verse, you know, and um, so praise the Lord. So here's two possible views, though. There's a whole bunch of people and, and you know, debates and all that, and there's two popular views on this passage specifically. Uh, as far as what exactly is Paul talking about in verses 9 through 15, view number one goes something like this, that Paul is addressing women in the marriage relationship, right? Here, here's why. The word woman um, is... Uh, oh man, I had all this right here for PowerPoint too, but uh, gone, right? And it's used in verses 9 through 15, and it could mean a single woman or a married woman in general, right? In the, in the context. So how do you know which woman Paul is referring to here? Is it to the single women? Is it to the married women specifically? Well, typically it's related to the word man, this word uh, used for women. So, so here it is, in verses 8 and in verse 12, the word man that is used here is anir, right, in, in, the, in the Greek. So anir, typically when anir is used, it's related to husbands mm. when it's used. So the word gone could refer to marriage relating to the wife. Now this is the first view. So now this word anir is not always used for marriage, so that's where the problem arises. It, it, it typically is, but not all the time, right? So there's some kind of compromise there. Some believe that Paul is referring to the marriage relationship because of that context. But and as we look at what Paul is trying to tell the women here in verses 9 through 15, it certainly doesn't line up with Scripture at all. Um, or I'm sorry, it, it does line up with Scripture, right? Because obviously, yeah, it, it, would, it would go with the marriage relationship. So, 
women pastors, they use this text specifically to validate, really, uh, as proof text for, you know, that they're, it's okay for them to be at the pulpit and teach over men, be overseers, to be pastor teachers uh, specifically. They'll point at this and be like, well, if you look at the word in here, you look at the word uh, right here for the woman, it's typically together, but obviously it's not always together throughout scripture. So view number two um, is it's not that Paul is talking about women in a marriage relationship specifically. Uh, they say Paul's talking about women in the church relationship, right? So women in the church service, when you gather together, this is what Paul's talking about. He's laying out the, the, the rules, if you will, right, for a woman when she comes to church. You see, looking at scripture, you can't, you can't take one word in the text and look at its definition solely and, and, and just come to a conclusion regarding the text and be like, that's what it is, that's what it means, because this one scripture says this. No, no, no. Yes, you have to look at the definition of the words in the text. So you have to look at the words, though, a near and gone, right? The, 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 what, what those actually mean. Yes, you have to look at the definition, but you also have to look at it in the context, mm. right? So, um, in, in which they're used. So, um, it's often been said that context is king. And that's true. You, you can take a word out of context and come up with a pretext, mm -hmm. right? And I believe that this is what a, a lot of people do with this passage. I believe Paul is talking about women in the church service, the church corporately, how women ought to be, basically. So take a look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, actually. Look over to your right a little bit. Let, let me tell you guys why Paul is speaking about uh, the church. Look at chapter 3, look at verse 15. It's, he says, but if I am delayed, I write, uh, wait a minute, yep, okay. If I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, you see, I believe in the context of First and Second Timothy and Titus, believe it or not, goes together with, with it because this is the pastoral epistles right here, right? It's written to a pastor as it pertains to the instructions given for the church and how the church ought to be. So I believe clearly that Paul is speaking of the women in the church, if you look at the context, in the, the general overview, basically, what the letter is talking about. Now, if you look at just the specific verse, obviously you'll be just like, you know, many women pastors today, and they're like, this, that's what it means, that's what it says right here in this verse, in the text. No, not in the context, though. You, get, you guys see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I had coffee, so I gotta tell me to slow down if I have to. Uh, but let's let's take a look at what Paul has to say about women in the church services. Okay, Paul instructs women in two ways in the church. First, he instructs them personally. That's going to be in verses nine and ten. And secondly, he instructs the women of the church corporately, and that's going to be in verses eleven through fifteen. So let's go ahead and look at the first uh, instruction that he gives personally. Uh, and it's, it's uh, in verse 9. It says, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves, uh, first of all, adorn themselves. And that's it. For the first instruction that Paul gives for the women is that they adorn themselves. Did you see that in verse 9? Yeah, but first of all, he says, In like manner. So just like the men dealing with the church service, like we talked about last week, and how the men ought to you know, conduct themselves in the church, and we talked about, you know, obviously in prayer, and, and would you guys go listen to that later? But they're to be the ones who lead out of prayer, basically, right? The men, to lift up holy hands without wrath and without doubting in the context. So just like the men, the women are to adorn themselves. Interesting, because it says in like manner. So this is instructions for them uh for the women, not not the men, okay? So the men don't get all like, oh, I gotta adorn myself. No, it's specifically for the women, okay? Girls, you are to adorn yourselves, and I'm pretty sure you're okay with that, right? <laughs> it's okay, it's good. The word adorn, right? Right, cause meo is the Greek and what it says, and we basically in our English we get the word cosmetic. 
from that word. So, girls, obviously it's not condemning cosmetics, right? Hairstyles or nice dresses or, you know, jewelry. He's actually encouraging it if you look at it closely. He's saying, hey, man, girl, it, it isn't, first of all, think about the girls, is it, it isn't that the, how do I say this? That's exciting if you think about it. Right? The very first commandment, right? Here comes in the Apostle Paul into the church, and here's the instructions for the men. Now, women, here's the, the very first instruction you have. Now you're like, oh, what's it going to be? Right? This is an exciting thing. You adorn yourselves. You're like, what? That, really? That's the first thing? Yeah. Adorn yourselves. Whoa, I like that. That's good. <laughs> right? um, I don't mean to do this, but... The guys brought it up last night, J. Vernon McGee, right? His famous quote of, hey, the bar needs painting, paint it. <laughs> so he's, he's not condemning makeup, right? He's not condemning nice hair. The word carries the idea of to put in order, right? So just put yourself in order or to decorate. Obviously speaking of the external, right? So, or, or be made ready. So Paul's not against women looking good. Right. Okay, so uh, women are to be nice, they're to be presentable. Hey, decorate yourself is basically what it's saying. So women are to be put in proper order, to be arranged so that all the people can come to a, a <clears throat> real worship service corporately, basically. So you should be put together well, right? So don't get the, just throw all the assumptions out of your mind right now. I know there's a whole bunch, and I'm going to combat against some of those. So. What, what does it mean to adorn yourself as a woman in the church service, right? Think about it. What does it actually mean? Here's five ways women should adorn themselves in the church service according to what the Bible says, okay? They should adorn themselves, first of all, what? What does it say in verse 9? Look at it. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves, how? In modest apparel, right? So modest apparel, the cosmeos. So this is talking about externally fashioning yourself basically um, so in well in order right and fashion yourself in order and I understand that it's you know summertime and you know there's a lot of women in the church and this isn't the church right we are the body of Christ we're just a little tiny little tiny little bit of the, the body of church but the body is throughout the world right and there's a lot of people a lot of different culture and a lot of different stuff and a lot of you know where, where people just dress differently, and I understand the differences and the whatnot, but this is this is what makes teaching for me tough, right? You gotta actually you actually have to say certain things that you think that are assumed, but there certain people they just don't know certain things, you know. I remember my wife talking to um, some of the some of the girls, uh, younger girls, and being like, hey, you know, the way you dress consider it, you know, before the men, and, and they didn't know certain things, and she was showing them this, and they're like, how come nobody ever told us this? And they changed right away, and then they eventually went back again, and I was like, oh, come on, Bethany, go talk again, <laughs> come on, but girls, you are to be godly women, godly women, adorn yourself modestly, right, <clears throat> don't show off the flesh, why? Because when you reveal your body, it's tempting to who? To men, right? Men are attracted to women. Women are attracted to men. But did you understand the men are attracted to women part? And you're able to share yourself. And you, we all understand. We're all adults, right? Right. Um, but we, we, women know how to attract, right? And that's where I'm trying to hit on. Why? Because when you reveal your body... You're, you're, when you lead, when, when you tempt another man, what are you doing? You're causing sin to happen and abound. You're, you're causing them and their relationship with God to just downfall. So everything that everybody else in the body of Christ has been put in order, they've been putting their positions in order, they've been crying and tears and stress and all kinds of stuff, just putting so much work and effort in that sense into, you know, building this person up in their faith and their walk with the Lord and then here comes the other member of the church and stumbles and all that work just went for nothing <laughs> and brought them down to the ground and it's scary so you you can ruin another person's walk with the Lord be careful of how low your shorts or your blouse may be 
Um, godly women don't dress like the world. <laughs> this is pretty obvious, right? They don't dress like the world. You're, you're to be set apart from the world. Don't listen to the advertisement on TV, on um, magazines, on, you know, just the, the world is advertising itself to itself. It was, it's not meant for you. You understand when you became a new creation, all things are passed away. You don't listen to, you're no longer bound. You're no longer, you know, to listen to the world anymore. The world has no authority over you. God now does. Now you have another order in a sense, right? No, no longer disorder, but now you're in order. And, and it's, a, it's a huge difference. So that, that's meant for the world, right? To teach the world. Certain women are just like... Um, really, if you think about it, I know this is kind of in your face, but it's kind of like Satan himself. He likes to come and deceive the people. He likes to come in swiftly, right? And, uh, and, and there are dresses that are meant to impress, right? And that's kind of what Satan does. He comes in to impress you, but to, to lead you astray. Get your eyes focused off of the Lord and onto the waves in that sense, right? And, and, and it's crazy, but they... There's, there's women out there that dress specifically to catch the eyes of men, to lead them astray. And they want, when the guys come around, they're like, hey, you're, you're advertising, here I am. And the woman's like, no, I didn't mean that. Well, why are you, you deceiver? <laughs> you, know? you guys get what I'm saying? All right, let's move on. Let's go to the second one. <laughs> Adorn yourself with <clears throat> propriety, right? Look at verse 9 in the middle. Um, what is this word propriety, right? This is a, it's a very powerful word actually, and it carries the idea of girls carrying a concern for how you affect other people, especially men, and how you dress, okay? So wow, you need to have a concern for how you're gonna affect other people Basically, before you put on any clothes, consider, is this going to stumble my brethren? Is this going to stumble other you know, men? The way you dress ought to be you know, looked at in light of how you are going to affect other men. So don't worry, girls, it gets worse, right? <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> it gets crazier or worse, okay? The definition of what this word means is don't wear clothes that are intended really to seduce or to solicit uh, a man. So in what you wear or, or dress, you need to be concerned on how it's going to affect those around you. You might say, well, that's their problem. No, that's your problem. I've heard that so many times. That's why I'm throwing it out right now. Um, whenever this topic comes up, that's always the first, like, that's not, I could dress the way I want. It's not my fault that they're weaker brethren. That's their fault. It's because they put their minds to, you got it, I heard it, okay? I heard it before. But the Bible is very, very clear on this topic. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Beware, right? If you're stumbling someone with the way you're dressed, it's called sin, right? So it's wrong. A, a godly woman is concerned about what she wears and how it's going to affect others concerning their walk with the Lord, right? Their, their spiritual growth. All of us the, as the body of Christ, right? The men have their part, the women have their part, and then in every, uh, we all have positions, and in every position, in every gift, and everything that God's given us, we're to glorify God. We all have one goal, and nobody is separate from that one goal of glorifying the Lord. So there's order, there's rank in the Lord. So all women should want a man to look at you from the inside, obviously not from the outside, but in many cases that's not the case, right? That's sad. But don't go and advertise from the outside. Why? Because that's going to change, right? Right? We all get older. <laughs> and it, if you're trying to, you know, for the women that are trying to impress the men, what's going to happen when the woman changes is the man's going to change. It's heavy stuff, right? He's going to be like, oh, you're, oh I'm out of here because I was just in it for the physical, the outside. I'm out of here. So you need to be who you are in Christ and who he's created you be. Walk in his will and you'll be safe. 
right? Don't walk in your own will and what the world teaches you, but be concerned about you know what's on the inside more so than the outside. So if you solicit or you advertise on the outside, obviously you're gonna um, attract the wrong kind of crowd, right? The wrong kind of guys. So he'll he'll definitely want what's on the outside. So thirdly, look at verse nine again. In like manner also that to the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with pro prepared pro propriety. <laughs> Whew, thanks, sorry. And uh, moderation, that's the third thing here. Adorn herself moderately. This word moderately, it, this speaks of discretion, sound, soundness of mind, basically, right? Humility, not being prideful or haughty, is basically what it, where, where it's all coming from. It carries the idea of controlling your own emotion, your own desires, right? This word not only speaks of what you wear, but what you do, right? So uh, it speaks of how you act. So not just the clothing, right, of the outward, but also the actions, the, the inward, the attitude, right? It speaks of who you actually are. So how are you acting? How are you moving? What kind of gestures are you making toward others? Good question to think about. Are they suggestive, you know, in how you dress? And who is it pointing to? Is it pointing to self or is it pointing to the Lord? John the Baptist, whenever people went to him, what did he do? Go to Jesus. <laughs> he pointed to the Lord. Get, get down there, right? I'm baptizing. He, he spoke of Jesus. You look at any person's ministry in the New Testament, they always pointed to Jesus, right? And that's the same thing. Every believer, if you're a believer in Christ, you're the church, that means you are in a ministry. And what do you do in that ministry? You're leading others to Christ. That's the Great Commission. You're giving the gospel. You're teaching them the word of God in one way or the other, right? And you always got to point them to Christ and all that you do. So adorn yourself uh moderately i love that um so not seductive in any way of your life right don't be all seductive in crazy ways like that be careful in what you say and what you do and it, it speaks of being in control right so uh be careful how you dress be careful how you move watch the actions you make be aware of your surroundings basically um, a godly woman is mindful and adorns herself moderately that's basically what it's saying bethany uh, man, I, I, I don't know how many times, you know, we've had some of these conversations, right, where there's just normal things that you do that you don't realize that you're doing that could assemble another person, right? Just like getting, getting your child out of the car. There's, you know, you don't think you're like, I'm just getting my child out of the car, right? Or, oh, oh I dropped something. There's, there's other ways to pick up things. You guys with me here? This is a little heavy for me, okay? <laughs> but I, I, we've had conversations like that, and there are certain things where she didn't realize, like, wow, thank you so much for catching that. I didn't even know that. But then she would tell me other things that, you know, that she had to watch out for that I didn't even know about. And it's, it's cool that, to have accountability in marriage, but what if you're not married? Well, who are you going to listen to? Well, listen to what the Word says right here and how you ought to be, right? Dress, that, yeah, all about it, Paul says. Do it, but consider before you do it. Why go and dress yourself without even thinking? In other words, he's challenging you to understand that the way you dress, is, it's far more than just the dress, right? There's more to this world than simple little things, right? It's the, it goes beyond that. There's spiritual things happening. There's people that have a walk with the Lord, a relationship with the Lord. And we gotta consider others above yourself. So number four, look at verse nine again. She also is, and so it says, in moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. So in other words, she adorns herself in simplicity, right? Don't, don't dress to draw attention to yourself. There's nothing wrong with new hair or clothing or jewelry, right? The pearls, nothing wrong with that. That's, that's not what he's coming against. Paul's attacking doing those things in order to draw attention to yourself. That's the point. Is this going to be more glamorous and glittery than, you know, every other girl in the room? They're, all the men are going to, you know, who's it drawing attention to? 
Is it drawing attention to Jesus? You know, a, a godly woman adorns herself simply because she's drawn attention to who? To Jesus Christ, that's why, and not herself. So girls, if you're, you, you know, you're moving or drawing attention to yourself, then what's happening in effect is you're drawing away the attention from God. You ever thought about, remember then the context, we're talking about the church corporately. When we come together as the body of Christ, there's a specific way uh, for the women in particular in this area. So now there's something wrong uh, with, well I should say it this way, there's nothing wrong with, okay, braided hair, you know, wearing jewelry, smelling nice, dressing nice, right, simple, um, whatever the cost may be, it, it doesn't matter, but, but uh, dress in a way that brings glory to the Lord, right? That, that doesn't draw the attention away from the Lord. Dress in a way that brings glory to the Lord. And don't be like, okay, so when you got saved, let's, let's get this little thing. Let's say you get saved, and it's been, maybe it's been like two years now since you've been saved. But you're like, oh, you know, the type of job I have, I don't make that much money. So all the clothes that I've had in my past, um, I have to keep wearing them because they, they were very expensive and I don't have the money to go out and just, you know, I'm not, I can't, can't do that, right? There's a challenge for certain people in that area, but you got to make it, you got to make the effort to get those things out of there, right? Replace them, go to the thrift store, whatever the, the cost may be, right? Do it. Um, let's look at the fifth thing right here. Look at verse 10. Women should adorn themselves properly. Verse 10, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. So girls, if you're professing godliness and exhibiting good works, right, in your life, it's going to be reflective, obviously, in your life. So not only is it going to be realized in the way you dress, but in the things you do, in the attitude, in the way your, your words come out, right? It's, it's, it's going to show the impact that God had on your life that you allowed him to have, right? The more you give unto the Lord the more it's going to be obvious it's going to come out of you, basically. So it, it'll be seen in the way you act and how you look. It's not about the outward, right? But the inward attitude, the, the, it comes out in the actions as well, the inward, right? Whatever goes in must come out, right? We understand in Romans, Paul even talks about nothing good can come out of me. Why? Because there's nothing good in me, right? It's to cry, Christ, he, it's all about Jesus. It's because he's in us, he's good, that anything good is able to even come out of us. So it's the same kind of um, thing right here. If you're professing godliness with good works in your life, it'll be reflected in how people look at you personally, really on the outside, and how you conduct yourself practically as well. So if you're drawing attention to yourself rather than Christ, you're not adorning yourself properly, right? And, and a godly woman is proper, according to the, the text here. So if you dress onto the Lord, it's going to show through your character. You're, you naturally exhibit certain things after this, right? You exhibit meekness, you exhibit humbleness, gentleness, you're, you're very soft-spoken, one who cares more on what others uh, think, except yourself you're not thinking about yourself you're more concerned about others and where their walk is with the Lord so you're more concerned about how uh, how she's going to affect others instead of self right you uh, as a woman so that's a godly woman Paul's talking about she adorns herself nice gets nice she's presentable uh, but it's all for what the glory of the Lord right don't neglect the goal right don't neglect the the it's all about Jesus, right? That's the purpose of the coming, to, going to church, being the church, right? That's the purpose of us even being in the, the kingdom of God with the Lord. It's to glorify the Lord, right? What are we doing here on earth right now? Is it for you to build your own empire and be all about yourself and do your own thing? And then, oh yeah, and God too. <laughs> what? <laughs> right? God is called, he's calling radical believers to be completely sold out for him. And if you're not, then you're, you're not in. God says, I don't even know who you are. But God, I did 98% of my life for you. I did this, that, this, that. Don't you remember? Uh, let's check the book of life. No. no, no mm -mm. It wasn't for me. You're doing it for yourself. If it wasn't 100% for the Lord, it's not for the Lord. Right? 
So, consider that. Let's come to the second section, please. <laughs> we said Paul instructs the women in two ways in the church, right? He instructs the women uh, personally, verses 9 and 10, and now he's going to instruct them corporately, right? Paul instructs them corporately in two ways in verses 11 through 15. What, number one, what women should do in verses 11 and 12, and we're going to see why women should even do it in verses 13, 14, and 15. So there's four things that I noted here. Um, I don't know if there's anything more or less. You guys can correct me later, but four things Paul instructs women to do in the church. Paul, he already instructed you girls on how you should come to the church personally, right? It's, it's all dealing with the inward attitude and how you know, how am I going to affect the lives of those around me? Am I going to build them up in their relationship with the Lord by not focusing on myself and things like that? So now he's going to instruct the women of the church uh, corporately in four specific areas, right? Uh, number one, women are to learn quietly. Look at verse 11. Don't get all mad at me and throw anything yet. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. The word silence right here is letting a woman, okay, letting a woman learn is a huge thing. Back then, a woman was not, she was not allowed to learn at all, right? At all. So when Paul says this and they're reading it, Timothy's reading it to the church, everybody's like, oh, what? This probably caused a big uproar among the men, right? Like, what are you saying? A woman could come and learn with us? They're, they can have knowledge and wisdom and understanding like we do? That's, we're men though, come on! That's, they, they thought themselves to be more privileged than women. So this is an actual, this is something that's going against tradition that Paul's doing. He's breaking that tradition now, and now all of a sudden there's freedom right here, right? So women were not allowed to read, they weren't allowed to learn, they weren't allowed to um, be instructed in that sense. So to gain, you know, wisdom and insight. So Paul's allowing them to be free. He's liberating them, if you will, right? So apparently there was a problem with, uh, right here in the context, with the this liberation, if you will, this freedom, possibly came, you know, too much zeal. Something happened here. They got excited and fired up about, you know, the ability to come to church and to learn and grow in the knowledge of the Lord, and, and, and you know, in a, in a sense, being like the man. And so something happened here, and they might have gotten a little vocal, a little outspoken, if you will, right? Um, and Paul is simply saying, girls, yes, you learn, but learn in silence. And this is this is a good thing, believe it or not. Now, I think this is a, a poor word, actually, the word silence, the way the translators put this in here. So uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You're probably already there. Just look over at verse 2. Um, it says, For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That word silence, this is the same word for the word silence right here. Peaceable, that word carries the idea of tranquility, right? Peacefulness. Just, ah, right? The, and it, does, it doesn't mean that it's a lack of abundant words, right? It's my way of putting it. Paul's not saying, hey, woman, be absolutely silent in the church. He's not saying that, right? You've got to understand the context here, understand the wording here. Uh, Paul's saying when, when you come to church, Learn with a peaceable heart, with that tranquility in that sense, right? A heart of understanding. Come not to be more than another, but just come to learn from the Lord and be at peace because it's the Lord who's teaching you, right? Don't get over, you know, like crazier than, you know, there's no, there's none of this. There's not a man above the woman and the woman above the man. There's nothing like that. We're all one in Christ. Christ came and he broke down the wall of separation between man and God. Which, but there's all kinds of stuff that happened between that as well. Women are entered in, right? Obviously they've been, but they're, as far as the traditional stuff goes, right? God smacked tradition in the face. and he, It's okay to change tradition, but he's not changing the word at all. So this word peaceable, right? Tranquility, this peacefulness. It doesn't mean, you know, so it doesn't mean be quiet. So yes, you can learn and speak, but in a right way. Do you guys catch that? There's an attitude adjustment in a sense here. Um, so look at verse 10 again. Actually, look at verse 11. So let a woman learn in silence with all submission. In other words, submit totally, right? That The last part of verse 11, this word submission 
Okay, so women are not to submit to all men. Let me just throw that out there. You're not to go and just be like, any man says something to you, and you're like, okay, really? why are you submitting? Because I'm a Christian. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not biblical, right? You are to submit in two areas of your life as a woman. Number one is in your marriage relationship, right? You're to submit onto the husband. Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Obviously, the husband is submitting onto the woman, and there's, they're both submitting to one another, obviously, right? <clears throat> so the woman is only to submit to the husband in the marriage relationship. But secondly, I think as well, is the church relationship, okay? Now, don't go too crazy. Women, just like the men, are to submit to the leadership role of uh, the church, to what God's called those in leadership. Just as the men submit, right, to the authority, to the leaders, to the, the pastor, elder, whoever you want to put it, um, as long as what they're asking doesn't violate what the Word of God says, right? Or doesn't violate the husband specifically as well. So, and it, obviously it's not going to cross the lines of Scripture, but, and of course, not to break the law, right? No man's going to come in and be like, you need to listen to me, and just, but it's breaking the law. It's, break, it's not what Scripture says. It's not, my husband doesn't agree. You're not supposed to listen to any man in authority if that's the case. So, thirdly, look at verse 12 here. Here's, here's a third thing. Um, it says, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. So in other words, not to teach men personally. Look at verse 12 again. Can, can women teach? Let me just ask you guys a question. Can women teach? Yep. Yeah. Yes, obviously. <clears throat> Believe it or not, Bethany, she's a great teacher. She just doesn't realize it. I see her with, with Amariah, right, and Malachi. She has the teaching techniques and all that. She's got it down really good. But remember the context, right? It's the church setting that we're talking about, right? So dealing with women in comparison to men. So apparently women are just not to teach man. They're not to be in a teaching pastoral role in or, or over a man, basically. So then who should women teach, right? That's a good question. Turn, turn with me to Titus. Go to your right to Titus. It's like three or four pages um, to your right. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Who should a woman teach? Uh, it's very clear in the scripture what the Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 3. It says, The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. Well, it goes on, right, in the text here. But the, other, the older women are to teach the younger women. And there's a reason for that. What's the reason why? Because they have more experience. They've been through the trials and the, the, the fire, if you will, the struggles of life. They've been through all the tribulations in that sense. So they've been through parenthood, right? They raise kids. They, they, they've, they've been married longer than you have, right? So it's right for the older women, the order, right? Older women are to teach the younger. And so that's what it's all about. So women should be teaching, but other women, right? So obviously God has granted women uh, great gifts, like amazing gifts. But one area God has purposely withheld for, from women is just teaching over a man. That's it. But what about Sunday school then? I mean, because there's a lot of, they're boys, they're not men, right? They're just little boys. That's all. I think, now I think high school maybe is pushing the limits here, right? High schooler boys, because some of them have, uh, they're already having that grown up attitude within their hearts. Some of them are already established financially. They got their own place at like age 15. They got that, you know, they got that heart and that attitude of already, they're ready to raise a family. So I would say that's kind of pushing the limits there, but I'm not too, too crazy there. But, um, so they're able to protect, right, their family, they're able to serve their family relationship, they're able to um, provide and do all that stuff, and that's, that's good and great. But women, women pastors, they say, Paul meant just not in marriage. That's all he meant, not in marriage, only, but in the context, it's the church. 
right? Why would Paul be talking about the church and all of a sudden one verse only meaning to be talking about uh, a marriage relationship and then go back to the church in the whole context of the whole thing again? That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, so stick with the context, right? Women should do everything as possible as they possibly can to encourage the man to step up to that role of leadership in teaching in every aspect, right, of leadership. The woman should do everything possible, hey, encouraging the man to take that lead role. Why? Because a lot of men don't take that lead role in prayer, right? It's true. They don't take that lead role in, hey, we're going we're gonna to get together, we're going to get in the Word of God. They don't. And that's why the woman, she rises up. And in that case, I think it's okay for a time, but specifically, biblically here, the woman's not to teach at all. But I, I think personally, man, if the man's not going to do it, you guys aren't getting anywhere in, in the Word. You're not being taught. You're not being, you know? So, I don't know. There's, there's a lot to this, obviously, because um, you could be like, what about blogs? What about articles? What about reading you know from women and learning from them in a different in that language right so there's a lot to it more than than here but i just want to hit on these areas um, let's look at the fourth thing women are not to have authority corporately look at the end of verse 12 it says a woman uh so i do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man to be in but to be in silence so uh, the word authority this speaks of hierarchy <clears throat> Right? That's supreme authority over another. And, and not that men are smarter or more knowledgeable. Uh, women, I think, are very knowledgeable than a lot of men. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot more wisdom, right, than mm. uh, I think personally than a lot of men. But you're, you're just not to be over uh, the husband, right, in, in the marriage relationship in Ephesians chapter 5 that we already saw, and not to be over a man in the church corporately. So take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. You're already there. Look at verse 1. It says, this is a faithful saying, if a man, and there it is, desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good thing. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Skip all the way down. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife. So clearly, Paul's talking about the men in the church, right? In the context here. And women not having that authority over them. There's a position conflict that happens when a woman chooses to teach over a man. And this is kind of what Paul is, this is what he's coming against right here, right? So clearly it's the man who's an authority in the context and not the woman over the church and those positions of teaching over the church. So if you want to get into the details, there it is. You just look at one chapter alone, the same chapter that you're already in, and you'll see the difference there. So we, we looked at what women should do in the church, right? Now let's look at uh, why women should do it, right? Why? Look at verse 13, 14, and 15. Why, why should women choose to listen to what Paul is saying here? Like, Paul, why should I even listen to you? This is, this is silly. I'm going to do what I want to do. Or why should I, you know, give me a reason why I should listen to you. And this is kind of what Paul's doing right here. He gives two reasons that I see here. Look at, the first one is because of hierarchy. Look at verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. So why should a woman do what Paul says in the church setting? Well, because there's hierarchy involved. That's why, right? Every believer understands we're all in the body of Christ, right? We all need to fall in line, keep ranks, right? Stick to your own positions that God has put you in. Don't get out of rank in that sense, right? There's priority. There's, there's, uh, there's, you just stay in line, right? So not just that the men, the men aren't any better, right? We're obviously, we're not any better than women are. Um, it's just that men were first, speaking of priority, Right? There's, that's speaking of the hierarchy. Why hierarchy? Well, they were created first, and that's the way God put it. Adam was formed first, then Eve was formed. Right? So just as it is in creation, so it is in marriage. It's the same concept. The man being over the wife as Christ is over the church. And now the third parallel is the same thing. So not just creation and, and, and marriage, but also in the church. Right? Paul spoke about equality. You guys remember in Galatians chapter 3, uh, 28, there's, uh, it basically says neither male nor female. In other words, there's no difference between man and women. 
There is no difference. We're all the same. We're just as much sinners as each, everybody else, right? As men and women, there's no difference. So, but there is also hierarchy that you got to understand in the church. You, you see hierarchy and equality are, they're not mutually exclusive, right, in terms. So are women equal to men? Yes. Women are definitely equal to men. We're no different in the eyes of God. There's no partiality with Christ. Amen. Yeah, amen. So why did God create women? For men, right? God said back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper. But notice the word comparable to him. There's no difference between the man and the woman. Now, girls, if a man didn't need help, God obviously wouldn't give us a helper, right? So, I mean, think about it. So, obviously, we need a lot of help, right? My, my wife oh, yes. would agree. Right. <laughs> so, there's equality as well as hierarchy. The man is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And God chose to put the man in charge as far as authority in a pastoral position, basically, or, or the teaching role, right, above uh, in the whole church. So, let's look at the second reason. I'm flying through this thing. Second reason, number two, is because of deception. Look at verse 14. It says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So why is a woman not to be over a man or teach over a man first? Is because of a hierarchy. Second is because of deception in and of itself. Notice Adam was not deceived. He, what, what, what was Adam? He just fell straight into sin. He was like, okay. <laughs> he took the fruit right away. He didn't have to be tempted. Eve was tempted. Right? Adam was just, he was dumb. Right? That's basically what it was. He was deceived and there was deception involved and that's what caused her, that's, that's what caused the fall of man, right? Or uh, it would cause sin to enter in, right, to mankind, to separate man from the Lord in that relationship they had. So what was this deception? What was it? It was when the serpent told her in the garden that if she ate of the tree the, 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 in the middle, right, of the garden, that she could be just like God. And that's exactly what everybody wants. They want to be their own God. That's the very first temptation. The very first sin, basically, is wanting to be like, be God, basically. So she took the fruit. She was deceived because she wanted, basically, to be like God. That would, she, she, that would, that's what brought temptation to her. You know, consider tem what's tempting to you. Some people, it's food, right? Some people, well, you guys get the idea, right? It's other things. But imagine being like, wow, I could be like God. I'll take it. Did you know that's all of you? <laughs> that's called pride. Pride wants to do its own thing. Pride, and that's why pride is so destructive and where sin comes from, really, ultimately, is because we want to be our own, right? So I believe her heart and her motive, uh, I, I think we're right. But the, the problem was deception in, uh, in, in the life of the woman, right? So I believe it, it goes like this. Women have a gentle spirit about them, right? God has blessed women with the desire of uh, just holiness and godliness in them, a desire to do what's right, basically. And, and it seems more toward the, the spirit, really. Uh, uh, the women are just, they lean towards more of the spirit. The men just seem to lean towards a lot towards the flesh, Right? I know we're all sinners, right? We were all, yeah, I agree. But uh, therefore, they're, they're, they're more susceptible to spiritual deception in that sense, right? Women are led more so by the heart, right? Men are more led by the head, right? The, and this is true. There's more emotion that goes into the woman than men. Men were just like, huh? What? Oh? <laughs> women are more, they're, they're just more from the heart. That's, you know, it's the obvious thing. So this is why I believe Paul says, you're not permitted to teach over a man. So uh, obviously there's not enough time to go over a lot of this, and I don't really want to go in depth about a lot of this, <laughs> but uh, let's look at verse 15. It says, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So what in the world does this mean? <laughs> Talk about throwing a curve ball at you, right? Like, whoa, what is, what? 
man, it just seems like the girls have a lot of rules here. I mean, you can't do this, you can't do that, this is how you, uh, you know, be careful in how you dress, and watch out in the way you walk, the way you wiggle, the way you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that just came out. But the way you, you know, the way you do things, um, man, Paul says, watch out in all of these things. Watch out, be careful, right? Because your spirit is open to all sorts of things. And nevertheless, he says, she'll be saved in childbearing if what? They continue in faith, love, and self-control. So there's uh, there's really three views that, I, that, that, that that's out there, right, as to what this verse actually means. Three, I would say, popular views. And the first is, when Eve sinned in the garden, obviously through deception, uh, there was a, a curse brought upon her. And the curse was childbearing. This is the first view. It's a view, okay? Don't, don't attack me. It's just a view. Um, so girls, when you're, you're having the baby, the pain, you know, the anguish, and the like, ah, and you just think, you know, I'm going to die. Ah, I'm going to die. And she feels like she's going to die. So Paul says, no, no, you'll actually be saved in your childbearing. You're not going to die. So even though you feel like you're going to die, you're not going to die. So this speaks of being saved physically, right? This first view from what? From childbirth. But wait a minute. Let me ask you guys, women die during birth, don't they? Yeah. So, there's Especially the problem. <laughs> yep, there's, they're giving birth. So, that's true, um, but that, that, that there's a problem. So, they say, oh, no, this is more of the, the principle. It's a general principle, right? It, it just, it's, that's all it is. I don't know about that. View number two speaks of women being saved emotionally. Interesting. Women, be careful in what you wear, is what it's saying, right? You don't have authority over men. Your place is not in leadership role in the church. Rather, your leadership role is with your kids, is this second view, right? So moms, you'll be saved emotionally through childbirth. There you'll, you'll, you'll receive God's fullness of blessings in your life. And uh, don't worry about being in a place of leadership in the church. Uh, you know, you have plenty of other things to do at home and plenty of authority roles there and, and, and with your kids. So thus you'll be saved as you continue in faith, love, and self-control. Basically, this view is at your, with your home, right? I don't know about that. So third view is, well, note carefully. Look at verse 15 again. It says, nevertheless... She will be saved in childbearing, right? So note verse 15 carefully. She, that word she in the Greek is singular, speaking of one singular girl. Interesting. So how is Paul referring to, what was he referring to here? What are you talking about one single girl? Now you really threw me off right here, right? <laughs> well, you have to look back at the nearest uh, and, what is it called? Antecedents, right? That's the nearest one is which which is the women, right? Speaking of the woman in verse fourteen, which is obviously speaking of who? Look at your Bibles. It's right there. Who's who's this woman referring to in verse fourteen? According to the, it's the nearest antecedents, right here. Eve. Thank you. So Paul's speaking about Eve in verse fifteen. Eve will be saved in childbearing. In the Greek text. The definite article precedes the word childbearing, right? So the original text reads, the childbearing. So a lot of scholars, they miss that. She, speaking of Eve, will be saved in the childbearing. Child with capital C, if you will, right? So it goes like this. Eve's sin, which brought separation in a relationship before God, obviously. But through her, Jesus Christ would come right, through Eve, bringing salvation back to, to mankind. So it has nothing to do with men. Notice that. Did you guys, there's nothing to do right there. Men and women have clear roles in the church, right, according to what the Lord put men and put women in position to, right? So uh, it's not how we feel or what we think. It's just according to what God says, right? When you come to church, you should be expecting to hear from God's Word, Right? Not the pastor. You come to hear from the Lord personally, devotionally, right? As a, as a general rule, you want to hear from the Lord. But it, it, where, where does it come from? It comes from the Word of God, right? So, um, 
That's all I'm saying, right? Everybody has their positions. This is the way God meant it to be. And he put the women in position on how they ought to be, right? And, and, and if you do that, what's happening? You're, you're going to be blessed, right? Why? Because you're in the will of God. You're not going against God's will and what you think and what you think your interpretation is of what Scripture is. It's based on what God said, and now you're just blessed. Just like the men are blessed if they continue in prayer and taking that lead role. That's, it's, that's just it. So let's pray. And then uh, let's open up for questions too, okay? Uh, Father, thank you so much, Lord, for uh, this time to go through your word and understand these uh, positions, Lord. Understand the roles uh, within the church, Lord, for the men, for the women. And uh, I pray you would continue to open up our eyes and teach us, reveal to us our hearts, Lord, that understanding that we're evil, Lord, and there's, there's disgusting things inside our hearts that we got to give on to you. Lord, I pray that you uh, would receive our humbleness or otherwise humble us, uh, God, that we might come out of this uh, deception, in, in, in a sense, Lord, of uh, really deceiving ourselves by keeping... Uh, that nastiness within our hearts. Help us to hand over and surrender everything in our lives to you, Lord, and live that quiet and peaceable life that you called us to live, Lord. And just we know that there's nothing that we can do in our own flesh, Lord, but it's only through your spirit. And so just thank you so much, Lord, that you're able to do uh, a work that is beyond us, within us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.